Welcome home, Relevant fam. My name is Norman, and I'm a part of the Relevant Dream Team. Thank you for joining us for Church Online. If you're new or you've been coming for a while, make sure you fill out a digital connection card so we can get a gift sent over to you. Today we have an awesome message for you. But first, why don't you stand up and get ready to worship. Here at Relevant, we believe that giving is an act of worship. And that's why we want to make giving super easy for you. Just text GIVE to 84321 or go to our website at relevantchurchgr.com forward slash giving. If you prefer the old fashioned way, you can also give by mail. One of the reasons why we give is because of the impact it makes in our community. We invite you to partner with us through giving today. This unexplainable, unconditional love, God, that you give it to us. You give it to us so freely every day, God. And I thank you that there's no other love like your love, God. No other love. Just sing that, no other love. No other love can mend your heart like running into my father's arms. It's not too late. It's not too far. You're calling to me. No other love. So you make all the broken beautiful. 
God, now Jesus, for you I give it all. You're all consuming. No other love can mend a heart like running into my father's arms. It's not too late, it's not too far. You're calling to me. No other love can mend a soul. You make all the broken beautiful. What's up, Relevant family? Thank you for tuning in today. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Robert Trice, and I'm the lead pastor of Relevant Church here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I just want to thank you for tuning in for our Relevant Church online experience. I'm excited and I'm honored, uh, and it is a privilege to be able to deliver to you the Word of God today. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing in the series that we're calling a masterpiece. Uh, we're in the book of Ephesians, teaching through the entire book of Ephesians. And today we're in chapter two, and this is part three of Masterpiece. And before we dive in, let's pray. God, I thank you because you are so good. Heavenly Father, I come to you as humble as I know how, uh, completely in awe of how you are moving in my life and how you are blessing our church and your people. God, I thank you for being such an awesome God. God, I pray right now because I have a heavy task to deliver your word, to share your gospel. God, I ask that you would speak through me. I am a servant. I submit to you. I surrender to you, God. Lord, help me to say the right words. God, help me to speak your truth, that all flesh would be silent. And I thank you because I'm not alone. So many other preachers and teachers are delivering your truth and your gospel today. And I pray for each and every one of them in Jesus name, that they would preach your truth, God, and that souls would be saved and that kingdom would be built in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We're in Ephesians chapter two. And like I said, this is part three. And I, and I absolutely love the text that we're dealing with today. It is a very familiar passage of scripture for most believers. And uh, like I said, in part two, let's see, let, let's see where we go. We're going to be in part two, uh, verses one through 10. Uh, and it reads, and it says that you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked following in the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the common ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works nor so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is a powerful message. Uh, Paul is continuing the letter to the church in Ephesus and, and just like the first two messages, verses 1 through 10 in the original text was literally one sentence, one entire thought. And it says, and you were dead. We have to stop right there because Paul is writing a letter to the church and he's letting them know that you were dead. 
that this 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 should grab our attention uh, like the word dead always grabs our attention if we hear that someone is dead uh, we immediately want to know who who is it why because being dead is so final it's such a final thing. We want to know uh, 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 who is no longer with us, who has lost their life, who will never breathe again, never think again, who won't be showing up to family functions again. Being dead is so final and it is so serious that we want to take it serious when we see Paul writing that you are dead. He says you are dead in the trespasses and sin. What is Paul talking about when he says dead? Because obviously these people were not physically dead and brought back to life. He's letting them know that, that you were spiritually dead in your trespasses and your sin. And what does it mean to be spiritually dead? He says you were unable to respond to God. You were unable to connect to God. You were unable to to please God. And when he says in our dead and our trespasses and sin, he's speaking of the violations that all of us have done against God, that we have all violated God in our own thoughts. We have all violated God with our own words, and we have violated God's in our deeds in the way that we live our life, that, that, that we we're dead and our trespasses and our sins. It says, in which you once walked following the course of this world and following the prince of the power of the air. He says that we were following the course of this world, the course of the culture, that everything around us and the direction in which the world was, was headed, that we were on the same course. We were doing the same thing as everybody else in the world. And then he says, following the prince of the power of the air. He's literally talking about Satan. He says that we were following Satan. And he said the prince of the power of the air. He called him the prince. And when I think of a prince, I think of somebody who holds a position of power and authority and control. And what he's letting be known right now is that Satan was once dominating us. That Satan was once in control of us. He was dominating our thoughts. That Satan was once dominating our speech and the things that we said. That Satan was once dominating the way that we lived our life and that we were following that. It says uh, that we were following uh, the, 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 the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work in the sons of disobedience. The spirit of Satan is now at work in everybody who disobeys God. In verse number three, it says, among whom we all once live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Point number one, don't ever forget the hell that God saved you from. This is for the believer. Don't you ever forget that you were dead in your violations against God, that we were violating God in our thoughts, our speech, and the way that we lived our life, that we, that, that we were dead because we, we followed the way of the world, that we followed Satan and allow him to dominate our lives. And it says that we gave ourselves... Uh, among whom that we all once lived in our passions, verse number three, that, that we lived in the passions of our flesh. It says that you were doing what you wanted to do. And, and not only that, and he says, and that we were by, by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So just like everybody else, we were just like everybody else. And we should never forget the hell that God has saved us from. Too many times when we relive the hell that God has saved us from, when we relive what it was like to be dead in our trespasses and sin, it comes off as bragging. It comes off as we're going to compare how bad you were and how bad I was. We laugh and joke about the stories and truth be, and I'm guilty of it myself. And truth be told, it was not a laughing matter. That the things that we were la that we laugh at that we once did, the things that we almost want to brag about that we used to do when we were in the world are things that offended God and things that made sure 
that we would not have a connection with God, that we would not be able to respond to God, that we would not be able to hear the voice of God. We were dead. Don't brag about being dead. Brag about this because life has now changed. Let me tell you something. There's only two types of people in the world, right? Those who are dead and those who were dead. Let me say it again. Two types of people. Those who are dead and those who were dead. Those who were dead are now Christians. We are in Christ. We have surrendered our life to Christ because we were dead. This letter is to those who were dead. Those, those who were in sin, who were. And if you are not in Christ, you are dead. You might be watching. And you might not be a believer. You, you, you're kind of seeking and trying to figure out this whole faith thing. And I'm not here to throw stones. I'm here to let you know that if you you're not in Christ that you are spiritually dead. You don't have the ability to come to God. You don't have the ability to respond to God. You don't have the ability to, to, to please God. And you might say, well, I, I'm not a Christian. How can I be dead? That means that you are outside of Christ. And if you're outside of Christ, then you're dead. You might say, well, well, I have another faith. I believe this or I believe that. That would be outside of Christ. That would be dead. You might say, well, I'm an atheist. That, that, that doesn't apply to me. The Bible doesn't only apply to believers. It applies to the entire creation, that everything that God created, whether or not your life lines up with it or doesn't line up with it, simply means do you have or not have access to God and the things of God. So if you are outside side of Christ that you are dead and those who are in Christ were once dead and that's why we sing our praises to God that's why we lift our hands that's why we worship him that's why we boast about who God is because we know what we used to be we know what our lives used to be like we know what the emptiness used to be like we know what it's like to be dead and to be lost but I'm here to tell you that there's hope there's hope in verse number four. Verse number four starts out, it says, but God. Woo! It says, but God. But God. Two of the most powerful words in the entire human language. We know in grammar that when you say something and then you turn around and say, but it cancels what you previously said. If somebody ever says, I love you, but... What they're about to say is the truth. <laughs> and it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of this world. We followed the prince of the power of the air. We followed Satan. We lived according to our own flesh and our own mind. And it says, but God, I don't know about you, but I was in sin, but God. We were sinners, but God. We were disobedient, but God. Satan dominated my thoughts, but God. Satan dominated the things that we would say, but God. Satan dominated how we would live our lives, but God. But God, I don't know what your situation is, but I promise you, if you get to the point where you can turn around and your situation can butt up against, but God, it's about to change. Everything that Paul is saying about the church of Ephesus, now it flips at but God. Verse number four, it says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses and sin. Thank you, Jesus. He made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Before God, we were hopeless. That's really what it was. We were God's enemy. And, and the, 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 the amazing thing about this is that we were God's helpless enemy. But he decided to save us. Point number two, uh, God gave us help by giving us hope. That we were helpless. That was if you're dead, you can't bring yourself back to life. If you're if you're following the course of this world, and it says living out our own flesh and our own mind, we didn't even recognize that we were doing anything wrong. Why? Because like everybody else, we were surrounded by people and surrounded by a world that celebrated our sin. We live in a world and we live in a time and there's no different time than now than ever before. Sin has always been celebrated. Sin has always been accepted and condoned. And now we are at a place where, where the acceptance and condoning of sin is at an all 
time high. My heart breaks for those who are opposing the word of God simply because they're accepted the way that they are. They're accepted in the world and our desires is to be accepted now. Our desire is not to please God. And I'm here to let you know that God is saying, even though that you were dead, even though uh, all of those things that you heard about yourself, that, that you offended God, that you violated, it says, but God who is rich in mercy. I'm glad because he's rich in mercy. It didn't say that he had a little bit. He says, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves us. I'm so glad that he loves me a lot, not just a little. I'm so glad that the but part didn't come after how he loves us, but the but God part came after it described how messed up I used to be, how messed up you used to be. It described the, the position and the state that we used to be in and then turned around and said, but God. And in verse number four, as we continue, it says, because of his great love with which he loved us, verse number five, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were violating God, even when we were offending God with our thoughts, our speech, and the way that we lived our life, even then he made us alive. We started out in chapter two being dead. And by the time you get to chapter, verse number five, you're alive. He says he made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. What does he mean when he says that you've been saved? That you have been saved from the wrath of God. When we were his enemy, we were subject to the wrath of God. We were subject to the punishment of God and what God would do to any and all of his enemies. But he saw us as helpless. He saw us as even when we were violating and offending the law and the word of God, he recognized that he loved us and he had a purpose and a plan for us. How can the title of the series be masterpiece if we're going to one day receive the wrath of God. He says that we are saved in verse number six. And it says, and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When it talks about being raised up, see right now, our, our Jesus, he died for our sins and he rose. He has all power. He has ascended into the heavens and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. It's talking about what's going to happen uh, uh, at the point when Jesus comes that we will all be raised up to go to be with him in heaven. It's talking about us being raised up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, verse number seven, so that in the coming ages, he might show an immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He says he has a plan. I'm doing this. So in the future, the, the, the kindness and the, the, um, the immeasurable riches of grace that I am going to shower on you as my children, as my sons and my daughters in Christ. I am going to blow your mind, the purpose and the plans that I have for you in the future. Uh, and verse number eight, this is where it really gets good. It says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Faith, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of the works so that no one may boast. The church has begun to downplay the grace of God as if it is not strong enough and powerful enough to truly save you from your sins. That, yeah, the grace of God is okay, but you need to live out a perfect and holy life. Don't get me wrong. We need to live according to God's word. We need to obey his word. We need to surrender our lives to him and live for him. But it's not in order to receive salvation or even to prove that we are worthy of salvation, which the scripture clearly shows us that we're not worthy, could never be worthy, could never, will, will never be worthy. But it is his choosing and his doing. It says by grace that we're saved, that, that nobody could ever take the credit for being saved. You can never take credit for God picking you up 
and saving you, breathing into you the spirit of God, that he filled us with his spirit, with it, which is his promise, his guarantee that he's going to come back for us one day, that you could never earn this salvation. There is nothing that you could ever do. We, we, we need to give God his proper praise for his grace, for the richness of his grace. We need to stop discounting and discrediting the grace of God because without the grace of God, I would not be standing here. Without the grace of God, you might not be watching, right? You would not be watching right now. And you might be watching me saying, but I'm not a believer. It is the grace of God that God has got your attention and you tuned in today. It is because of the grace of God, even if you are outside of Christ and if you are dead, he is pulling you in right now simply by watching this. You need to know that God is pursuing you. This is not a coincidence. You are watching this right now because you need to know that you are dead and that you are outside of God, but he loves you so much that he wants to give you life, life everlasting, eternal life. By grace, you can be saved. Say yes. Say yes that Jesus died for your sins and that you can put your trust and faith in him and have eternal life. Say yes. God is calling you home right now. God is calling you home right now. You may be watching me and you know that you've been praying and saying, God, if you're real, show me you're real. You know that you've been crying yourself to sleep and saying, God, I need answers. I need you to show up in my life. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is God showing up in your life. This is God answering your prayers. This is God meeting you where you are and telling you right now that I love you so much that I know that you feel helpless and I know that you feel hopeless and without Christ we are helpless and we are hopeless but in Christ <laughs> it says by grace that we're saved and we have eternal life let's read thank you Jesus uh, verse number 10 and verse number 10 is amazing it says for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works that we should walk in them. It says we are his workmanship. That's where we got the title of this series, Masterpiece. We're his workmanship, which means when you see a believer, they are literally, you get to see the love of God at work. When you see a believer, you get to see the grace of God at work. You can see God transforming a mindset that Satan no longer dominates my thoughts and my thoughts that my thoughts no longer violate or trespass or transgress against God. He no longer dominates my speech and my speech no longer violates or trespasses or comes against God and his will and his work in my life. That God's workmanship, he's working on my life and I am a masterpiece in the making. Point number three, you are a masterpiece in the making that God is at work at your life. I don't care where you are and what you're doing. If you have surrendered your life to Christ at any point, he has been and will be until the day of Christ be continuously working on you that you are the workmanship of God. You are a masterpiece at work that your thoughts that he's helping you to work through your thoughts and your mindset and that you need to be in the word of God so that you can renew your mind and to change the way that you think. And once you begin to change and to transform the way that you think, you will change, God will change and transform the things that come out of your mouth. The people around you won't be able to recognize you anymore by the way that you think and the way that you talk. And after that, your life will begin to transform and change. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Verse number 10 says, uh, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created for a reason. He's making us and shaping us and changing us. He says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a work for the church to do. If you are part of the church, if you are part of the body of Christ, the word of God declares very clearly in verse number 10 that he prepared a work beforehand. Before he, when you were still dead, when he died for our sins, when he showed up and he saved us, he saved us, we couldn't save ourselves. We were helpless and hopeless and he gave us help by giving us hope. He came and he let it be known that you are my masterpiece 
peace and I have my hand on your life and I'm, I'm working out the intricate details of your thoughts and your speech and your life. And if you would apply this to your life and if you would humble yourself and you would seek his faith, if you would call out to God that he has a work for us to do. And I'm calling you church, relevant church. There is a work in the kingdom that we must do. There is a work in the world that we must do. There is a gospel of Jesus Christ that we must share to all the nations. There is a love and a forgiveness that we must give to those who don't even deserve it because we didn't deserve it. How dare we hold grudges that we are a free people. God came to bring the dead to life. That we were all dead. And it says uh, that it was like the rest of the world, like all of mankind. We were just like everybody else. I would encourage us all not to become arrogant or haughty believers. That we would never forget the hell that God saved us from. That we would recognize that God helped us by bringing us hope. And that you would know for the rest of your life that you are a masterpiece in the making, that God's hand on your life, that, that, that those hard things that you're working through and wrestling with, with God's word in your relationship, it is a part of the sanctification process of each and every believer, and that we would learn to surrender to the hand of God on our life, and that we would surrender to his word. Don't fight against him, because he says that I prepared for him I prepared beforehand good works for you to do. God has a work and a plan for us. And if you're watching and you're saying, I want to be a part of that. I, 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 I want to come to life. I don't want to be dead. I, don't, I definitely don't want to violate God or be against God. The Bible says that Jesus died for our sins. He rose with all power and he's seated in heavenly places and that you have the opportunity right now to say yes, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Say yes, that Jesus is the son of God, that yes, he died for my sins. Yes, I want to accept him into my life. Holy Spirit, fill me, lead me, guide me into all truth. There is so much joy and happiness for the life of a believer. I have joy in knowing that my hope is in Christ, not in this world. And I'm so happy with the relationship and the love that he has for me and the plans, the hope that I have for the future that he has for me. And I'm so excited for you to say yes to Jesus today. Today, if you decided to say yes to Jesus, please fill out the connection card. Let us know you said yes. Text the word yes to the number you see on the screen. We wanna pray with you. We wanna connect with you. As believers, we are not meant to do this thing alone, but we all need help. We all need support. We all need brothers and sisters around us, loving us and encouraging us and helping us along the way. And if you wanna learn more about Relevant, we want you to go to Starting Point. Starting Point is the front door to our church, how you learn uh, what we're all about and how you can join and be a part of who we are. And if you wanna engage with other people who are growing in their faith, I encourage you to sign up for a small group. We call them regroups. Go to our website, fill out the connection card, let us know you wanna be a part of a regroup and we'll plug you in right now. And throughout our small groups throughout the week, we talk about what the message was on Sunday. What were our takeaways? Maybe some, what were our challenges? How God is blessing us? And it is an amazing way for you to get to know other believers and that you can grow in your journey, not by yourself, but with other like-minded people who have a desire to learn, a desire to grow, and the desire to become what God has created us to be. I'm so excited for you. Um, I'm excited to be able to connect with you in the future. In order to do so, please follow us on all of our social media platforms and share this with your friends and with your family. I hope that this was truly a blessing to you. I pray that it was a blessing to you. Join me next week as we continue in the series called Masterpiece, where we pick up in uh, Ephesians chapter two, we're gonna pick up in verse 11, and I have a, a huge announcement to make next week as well. God bless you. Let me pray for you before you go. 
God, I thank you for each and every person who is watching. God, I pray right now blessings. God, I pray uh, uh, that, that people would accept your forgiveness, God, that they would, would humble themselves and confess their sins and let it be known that they need a Savior because you are truly a Savior here to save, God. I thank you for each and every person that has committed their life to you today. I thank you for every person who may say, I'm a Christian, but I need to come back home. Prodigal sons and daughters are welcome home and, and we're here to embrace and to love them. God, those who may be curious about church or curious about about you. Help them to take their next step as we all have next steps to take. God, I pray blessings. I pray fellowship and I pray that your pre presence would be with each and every one of us throughout our week, that we would encourage each other and that we would uh, uh, continue to fast and continue to pray and be in our devotionals and connect in our small groups. God bless in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you guys. And I will see you next week.